All right, so what I want to do for this video series I'm going to start is critiquing things I see on Instagram and giving my spin on them. So I know, I know it's very played out, but I'm trying to do it a little bit different. You know, I'm not looking for like low hanging fruit. You see a lot of these influencers, these people will find other guys, other influencers online who are doing things that are just obviously retarded or just like attention grabs. And so they're really easy to call out and that's not really what I'm looking to do. I'm not really looking to like necessarily call out most anyone. I am gonna like fuck around and have some fun. But these are all people that I follow or were suggested to me in my feed. So, I mean, it's not like I, I don't like these people. I agree with a lot of what they say. So what I'm trying to do with this is I'm trying to present information that seems like it makes sense, uh, but maybe it's not the whole story or maybe it's not really the way it is at all. And this is gonna cover, you know, the fitness industry, but also some like uh, rehabilitation stuff as well. Just everything that I have on my Instagram. All right, so let's take a look. The first thing we have is a guy critiquing these oblique side crunches. So let's check it out. Please stop wasting your time with this garbage heel touch oblique crunch. It's potentially injurious. Well, first of all, gotta say it's not like garbage. It's actually a super valuable exercise if you do it right. Now, if you are just like teapotting side to side and just going through this global flexion and you're just orienting your spine, well, it's probably not the best thing. But if you do it right, what it is, is it's like a, it's an, internal orientation of these ribs and a side bend where you're closing the distance between like your armpit and your hip instead of just leaning over the hip. So if you alternate through there, that's a great, it's a great fucking motion because that has your ribs going through reciprocal motion while one is internally rotating, one is externally rotating and coming up. So that really promotes relative motion. It's a really good way to loosen up your back and kind of bring your rib cage back to neutral, bring your pelvis back to neutral. So. That's a fantastic fucking exercise, actually. But if you do it wrong, it is a bad exercise. But I would never say that's a waste of time exercise at all. It's to your spine. It's not going to get rid of your love handles. Let me show you something that actually works. Remember. So this fat guy is going to show us how to get rid of our love handles. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm not trying to be a dick, but don't you just love that when you have some dude with a fucking belly trying to tell you what it takes to get at? Getting rid of the fat around your midsection comes from what you put in your body. Stop eating like crap. If you... I mean, again, he's coming at you pretty stern for being 18% body fat. Like, you're above average body fat. You're not lean at all, especially in the fitness industry. If you really want to work your core, get on your feet. Connect a band to something stable. Interlock your fingers right in front of your belly button. Walk out this way. Get yourself an athletic stance by pushing your knees out. If you're a beginner, go in and out like this. This is going to work your obliques. This is going to work your... It's not working your obliques at all in the same way, though. I mean, this is an anti-rotation movement now. Instead of working your internal obliques and external obliques for that side bend, now you're just resisting rotation. So that's, that's not really the same thing at all your core because the band is trying to pull me that way i've got to resist that once you get stronger leave it out in front of you go up and then down, jack it off side to side figure eights and alpha Sorry, bits. Know, that's I'm actually gonna work your core even work your glutes a little bit most importantly get you better not older okay so back pain fix they post they just repost a lot of shit so sometimes it's really good sometimes it's garbage i would put this under garbage no offense dude uh, next we have Nick Tregilly, Mr. So gay for pay himself, and I, I think Nick's kind of an asshole. Uh, he's got kind of a bad reputation in the industry, but I really like that he's willing to just post whatever. He doesn't give a fuck, uh, and it makes sense. I mean, why should he give a fuck? No matter what he says, people are always going to bring up his past to him and throw that in his face. So I respect him for staying out and staying in the forefront of the industry. All right, so let's see what Nick has to say about this guy. I'm going to just give you my commentary, and I just realized that I'm giving you commentary on somebody giving commentary on somebody, so it's like... What if someone gives you commentary on this? That's like four levels deep. It's kind of ridiculous, I know, but here we go. So let's check it out. Mistake I'm seeing guys making is just doing regular speed curls when they get in the speed curls. Never heard that term before, but Nick, God, he's fucking retired. So the guy was saying a mistake a lot of people make is just doing the same regular speed curls every single time. So I'm guessing he's going to talk about varying the rep tempo. Speed curls wasn't what he was talking about, Nick. Look, fucking listen to the guy talk. Yeah, make sure you wear your fake Rolex and your fake gold chain before you get to the gym. That's going to increase your strength by like 200. What does that have to do with anything as well, either? I mean, you'll hear me critique a lot of things, but I'll never critique what someone's wearing, at least. 100% I heard. What I want to do in this video is show you three different ways that you can do your curls so that you can start extracting more growth, forcing shit. I didn't know you could extract more muscle growth. You must. And like now you're just making fun of the way he talks. Like, what does that have to do with anything? 
when you make a lot of content, you just, you've got fucking shit spilling out of your mouth. So I'm sure he's not even paying any attention. So again, waiting for something of value to come from this critique, Nick. Let's see what you got. You must be like an archaeologist or something that digs for dinosaur bones. If you slow your reps down, you do four seconds on the eccentric portion of the movement like I'm doing right now. Listen, as long as you're slowing down the repetition, you're just not going at your natural speed that you typically do the exercise at, that's good enough. You don't have to literally count one, two, three, four, and what is wrong with counting to four? <laughs> like, why are you critiquing that? Like, what is wrong with tracking how long you're going? A lot of people like to track everything. I don't think that's unusual. And four seconds is actually way too fucking long. Understand that the- Four seconds is not way too long for a negative. A lot of people do four second negatives. The tempo should be the same going up and going down. The next thing Again, not always, not a lot of time, maybe not even most of the time. Typically, you want a slower eccentric going down, a more explosive concentric coming up. It's pretty basic. I would not critique somebody for talking about counting four seconds on an eccentric. The thing I want you to do is static holds, where we literally just hold at the point of maximum resistance. And static holds has nothing to do with you increasing the size of your arms. Yeah, you'll increase your strength and your endurance, but if you want bigger arms, no static holds. Uh, again, are you going to build a lot of more muscle tissue by doing static holds? No, but you're not going in there and this is your arm workout just doing a static hold. If you're already fatigued and you're doing a lot, what I like to do is I like to do like a static hold at the end of my set instead of doing like a drop set or just stopping the set. I'll squeeze and hold that, that really tough middle range and I'll also really focus on the pump. And in fact, I mean, what I'll do is I'll actually, let's say I'm, I'm doing like a, a preacher curl with one arm. Once I get to the end, I might even like vary up where I'm internally and externally rotating from the shoulder, supinating from the palm, and slowly dropping and trying to fight that as much as I can. So I'm keeping elbow flexion, but I'm changing a few variables. But there's nothing wrong with doing a rep and when you're right at failure, squeezing at the end, like that's, that's awesome, why not? Focus on hitting all hand positions. Now, when you're using the barbell, you can't hit all hand positions. So this exercise is actually no different than the preacher curl he was just doing before. But if you wanna hit... It is a little different. I mean, changing the hand positions changes how much of the long head you get, how much of the forearms you're getting, and so on. I mean, it's good to play with it. There's nothing wrong with anything this guy said. He's not saying only do the static curls. I mean, that's the only thing you can really critique right now. I hit the short head and the long head of the bicep. Focus on doing preacher curls like he's doing, and then focus on keeping your elbows up and doing exercises from there so you can focus on hitting the short head of your bicep. Terrible advice. First of all, don't really worry about the short head, long head at all, okay? like. As long as you're using different hand positions and different elbow shoulder positions, you're going to get what you need and develop both of them. But you really shouldn't be doing that much work from here. That's a really ineffective position for us to do work from. You don't get a good stretch. If you really want to isolate the long head or the short head, you need to do uh, what they do in isolation from the other muscles. So what I mean is like your long head of your bicep, it helps with the very beginning range of shoulder flexion. So. If you really depress these ribs, especially if you do like an alternating like standing curl, if I bring down this rib and I do, I do that first start of the motion with a little bit of shoulder flexion, that's gonna really get isolation out of that long head because your, your short head doesn't do that. And if I wanna get a little more out of the short head, I would wanna get a little bit of shoulder flexion from that transverse uh, angle, that transverse plane, so that'd be like, leaned over like on a concentration curl. So I'll do like a concentration cable curl a lot where I'm really stretching down, trying to touch the ground, and then that elbow will just move just a little bit across and you're gonna get a little bit more out of the short head from that. But again, this is really minor. Like I said, don't worry about long head versus short head. Just hit every angle, hit all the different grips. All right, what do we have here? What is he saying? Um, less is more, stop training your arms for 60 minutes. Most people don't need to, but I do. Uh, if your arms are stubborn, just designate one set a week and put 100% into that workout. Terrible advice. Arms are like the muscle group that you can overload almost more than any because they're just a single joint motion. They can really take a lot of volume. They tend to respond better to like pump work compared to just going really heavy. So yeah, I, I think that's terrible advice. Do one all, out, one all out set a week for arms if your arms suck. That's fucking terrible advice. Chase the pump, not the pounds. How are you gonna do that with one set, Nick? Fucking dude, and he sells coaching. Right, so we have E3 Rehab here, and I really like one of the guys that are a member of this team. The other guy, I don't like at all. We've had a little bit of back and forth on IG, believe it or not. Sometimes I uh, have disagreements with people. I'm blocked by a few. Fouad Abiyad, I wish you would unblock me. I didn't do anything wrong. You were just being sensitive uh, at the moment. 
Um, Coach K in one, he blocked me because I called out some stupid shit. Uh, again, not super like confrontational, just voicing the other view. And I got blocked and a couple other people, but this guy didn't block me. So what I got into a disagreement with this guy about was pretty stupid. It was just upright rows. He had made a post talking about how upright rows are a great exercise and they're not dangerous at all. And I said, I believe they're not dangerous. I do them, but I think a lot of people lack the mobility to do them and get benefits from them. So I don't really recommend them to a lot of clients. Like out of all the shoulder exercises, there is a higher chance of just a normal everyday person injuring or tweaking something doing an upright row than most other shoulder moves. And he just said that was such bullshit, disagreed with me, wanted studies on why. And I'm just like, most people don't have that much internal rotation. Like that's the fact that there's no bad exercise, but some people aren't set up for it. So anyways, uh, let's check this out. This is about quadratus laborum pain, QL, the lower side of your back. It happens a lot if we get asymmetrical, which is really common as we're lifting heavy and we get close to failure, we might have like a little shift. Typically it's on the right side on most people, but it can definitely happen on the left. So let's see what they recommend. Okay, so, uh, so they're saying if you have pain, you should do a isometric side bend. That's not bad. I wouldn't say that's level one. I probably would honestly do a, a passive stretch of breathing, or I would uh, try to activate the antagonist a little bit, which would be the opposite side QL, maybe through an opposite side hip hike. You know, depending on how tight it is, you could do just a little bit of a slow eccentric on it. You got a lot of options. Isometric's not the worst. If it's really tight, it's probably not where I would start though. I might start on the other side isometric, but I think he's saying start on the side that's tight. All right, so we have here, we actually have a side bend. So now we're taking it through a full shortening and lengthening cycle. And if you're having pain in your QL, I probably don't recommend this, at least not this early. So we want to think about usually when your QL is shortened, maybe I can use my pelvis model. Let me see if this works. This might be terrible. I don't know. Okay, so there's my pelvis. So uh, let's say we are tight on our QL on the right side, because that's typically what happens. A lot of, oh, my sacrum fell. Let's try this again. Okay, so a lot of times we, there we go. So a lot of times this left side will kind of come forward and out and this side comes up. So we have this right hip is higher than the left, okay? When it's in that position, the QL that attaches here is really tight because it's, it's, it's in a shortened position. So what we want to do is we want to figure out a way to get this to drop and to open. So we need this to turn in and to raise a little bit. So in order to do that, we need to fire a couple muscles on this left side. We need to work on like anterior glute mid. We need to work on adductors to get this to turn in. We need to work on hamstring tie-in to get this to pull down. Cause a lot of times this is a positional thing. Oop, last again. A lot of times your QL is tight just because of where it is and you can do as much work. All right, I'm giving up on this. Hope that did something. And you can do as much work as you want, but if your pelvis is in that jammed position and you're just orienting around that, these side bends, I really wouldn't recommend. If you have really bad QL pain, first thing I would do is I would try to see if that hip is higher on that side. And if it is, I would work on improving external rotation on that side and internal rotation on the other, okay? Uh, let's look at what else they got. And again, you might be fine to do this. It could be totally fine, but if it's painful, you probably don't want to load it that early. Uh, again, side plank, so it's another kind of isometric move. Again, that's fine. Uh, what I would focus on more is the actual opposite side rib. So again, if that QL is tight, so say I have a tight QL here, and this shoulder is gonna be lower, this shoulder is gonna be higher typically, and this hip's gonna be lower. This rib is really flared. If I can pull this rib cage down, that hip will actually wanna go in position a lot easier. So depending on what side you're, you're tight on, if you're tight on the right side, like most people, I would really focus on getting these left internal obliques to fire, because that's gonna help position your hips more neutral so your QL will relax. So, I mean, I don't think they're thinking that deeply on this. I definitely probably wouldn't recommend just the bilateral isometric extension very early. Again, these would all be down the line. So basically what they recommend if you have QL pain is just exercise it. And again, exercise through it is not always the answer. Sometimes it is, but if you're a rehab, you know, IG, I think you would look at it more from more of like a rehabilitation standpoint instead of just, you have pain, exercise through it. I would look at it a little more holistically, personally. 
dumbbell RDL again. Could be totally fine, but again, this is for people that have pain. <laughs> okay. So this, I don't know why, this is so funny to me. So I don't follow Jared Feather or Mike. I don't know if you saw my other videos. I'm not the biggest fan of Mike. But since I did those videos, I have just so much content from him and RP just getting flooded. And I don't mind Jared Feather at all. I, so I, I watch this stuff when it pops up. So I just thought this was funny though. So let's check this out. This is him looking like so hardcore in the gym. Like just so flexed or so jacked. <laughs> and what do you think he's gonna write about? Just fucking giving it your all, pushing it to the limit? <laughs> Not exactly. Let's check this out. This is the caption. So many bullshit, I'm hardcore bro mentality out there talking about how at the end of the day, I gave it my all. Hot take, just focusing on going hard in the gym is leaving games on the table and not doing everything possible. Imagine demanding more of yourself. The attention to numerous variables beyond just the workout intensity. Imagine forcing yourself to understand complex principles like periodization and recovery and then implementing them for a better outcome even if you want to do the opposite. Not that complicated, honestly. Uh, this level of de detail requires a deeper understanding of science and a commitment to constant adaptation, making it a more intricate and demanding process than straightforward physical exertion. I mean, it's not that hard to not go to failure and to progressively overload and use a decent range of motion. I don't know what exactly we're talking about here. Next time you get done with a three or four hour gym session, pretending to go to failure every set, just remember you didn't give it your all. You took the easy way out and you continue to do so just to pretend you're hardcore. So who are these fucking people doing three or four hours in the gym? I mean, if you are doing that, you ain't doing shit. You know, I don't, I don't see people with an intensity problem. When I go to the gym and I look around, I don't see people just going too hard that they're, they're damaging themselves and hurting their gains. I see a lot of fucking pussies around who don't know how to keep tension and don't know how really to push into discomfort uh, without compensation a lot of times. So, I mean, I just think this is funny. It's like such a hardcore video, an image of him with you know, all of his muscles and he's just saying like, man, I'm so hardcore because I'm not hardcore basically. <laughs> So this got my attention in the comments. This guy says, you should talk to Mike about how he puts out false info and has a superiority complex then. Two sides of the same coin. Which I thought was pretty interesting actually because you don't see a lot of people call him out. Um, and what does Jared say? Jared was pretty interesting too. Uh, what false info do you mean? Oftentimes people very intelligent say a lot of good shit and a lot not so good shit. So I mean, that's kind of cool that he actually says that and he doesn't just say Mike is infallible. It's up to the logical thinking human to sift through and learn from multiple sources, including me. That's a fucking great response. I love it. And then this guy keeps going. You can and should very easily be able to go through his posts and find at least one wrong thing in every five videos. It's an alarmingly consistent issue with him. <laughs> well, I'm not gonna disagree there. Here we go, it kind of goes into some specifics here on this. And Jared has a nice little response. Uh, I should go through and find things I disagree with him exactly and do what with that? Do you think I have come to my own conclusions on what I might disagree with him about? It's interesting because in the video I posted, the first video on Dr. Mike, I had a section in there on how they follow the same principles, but they do not use the same exact nuanced technique. Like Jared Feather keeps much more intradominal pressure. He has a lot more rib cage mobility as far as internal rotation and actual external rotation doesn't orient the rib cage as much. And so I think this is really interesting to note that he's actually saying like, don't you think that I have come to my own conclusions myself? I'm a smart guy as well. Like I don't agree with everything Mike says. So again, you Mike fucking fanboys, listen. So um, here are the prehab guys. So these guys, you know, they put out some decent info, especially for the general public. One thing I really don't like that they do is they do all these point of view clips where you see it's like, oh, a point of view, this is fucked up on you, but you do this one thing and you're fixed. Wow. So I'm just going to show you a few of these and my thoughts on them. Point of view, you did this dolphin push-up strengthening exercise for your shoulders and it actually made your neck pain go away. So, I mean, we're getting some upper rotation of the scapula. If you're breathing right, you're also going to get some good anterior expansion around the neck. So that, that could be a good reason why that would happen. But if you're not being nuanced and you're not aware of your neck position, you're not thinking about your breathing, this could also make your neck a lot fucking tighter. I would never say this one thing is going to make your neck pain go away. It's pretty multifaceted. Even if you did this perfect, your neck pain is probably not going to go away just from that. There's probably some rotational issues. You probably got to look at the rib cage. You have to look at the jaw and the temporal skull, all kinds of bullshit.
Again, these are physical therapists, so I would expect them to not quite be so clickbaity. Point of view, you start working on hip mobility and your low back pain goes away. Now that I can't really say I really disagree with. It could go away by doing hip mobility, but here he is just doing one little silly exercise and when he's doing it, he's actually having like a lot of orientation pattern going on. He's not really promoting relative motion at all. Probably not gonna make your back pain go away. I'm not saying it's a terrible thing to do, but if you have back pain, that's not it. What is this one? You start doing mid-back mobility exercises such as this, and suddenly your rhomboid pain starts to go away. Maybe, or maybe it gets fucking tighter. You don't necessarily want to go into the shortening pattern right away whenever something feels off on you. A point of view, your mid-back feels stiff, but your physical therapist taught you the easiest way to open up your back. So now every time you get the feeling, you do 10 reps per side and it's gone. That's long and stupid sounding. But again, look at this. We're getting a lot of orientation. These guys just go through global movement patterns. They're not very specific with what they're doing. Look at right here. Look at, look at the movement we're going to get here like bending into the wall. A lot of times you want to put a block or something there if you really want to isolate the spine, especially the T-spine. Okay. All right, so this is kind of deep and I actually tried to uh, do a take on this pretty in depth using my pelvis model, but it's getting a little heavy. I don't think most of you guys are really gonna be interested in the mechanics of that, but I'm gonna make a separate video for that. But what I want to do real quick is I just want to show you uh, a couple things from squat you and touch on it super fast. So check this out. From flaw to flawless, okay, when Madison did this, her hips were uneven. The hip imbalance also affected her Olympic lifts. Notice the same shift come out of this time. Shift to the right. Left side not as open. So listen, that not as open. So when screening, this is what he does called the favor test. The right one, open pretty good. The left, a big restriction. Okay, so. <sighs> That's a fucking shitty test to do, first of all. Um, it's not always a test of someone's external rotation, the ability to open. If their pelvis is really anteriorly tipped forward, which that girl's is, and the, the left side more so, that creates a lot of issues. The pelvis is so tipped forward that it's, it's not gonna open as well. The vastus lateralis is also leveraged as an internal rotator, so it's not gonna open as well, but it's not representative of what's going on at the actual innominate bone. That's actually flared out, it opens plenty. That's not the issue. We need to bring it back and actually turn it in to get internal rotation space. Again, I'm gonna go in details on this in a different video if you wanna know the real reasons and the, the in and outs of why. So he's doing a banded distraction. Uh, I, this is kind of pointless. They feel good, but they don't do a whole lot. I used to be a big fan of them and the way he was doing it in particular is not gonna give her any really good benefit. Again, you don't need to open this. This femur is already out there. I mean, I, that's anatomical, that's the way it is. Okay, so what we have here is we're doing like a single leg airplane. And again, this is an external rotation movement. She does not need more external rotation. She doesn't need more hip flaring. She needs that sucker to turn in and to come back. So that's the exact opposite of what I would do. So I'm watching him do all this and I'm like, okay, well that doesn't make much sense. Now she does get a little bit better reading, but she's all oriented. And just loosening up that air is going to get you better range. And maybe she had a slight posterior tipping effect, but we don't need that hip to open more. We need it to tip back. So this isn't a good thing. And then what do we have? We have another opening exercise, which you don't want to do. This is not where I would have her. And so I'm watching her do this. And then look at this. He says this is an improvement. That's still shitty, that's still a shift, like a total shift. Like look at this, she's already completely over that right side. The problem is he's not looking at the system as a whole, he's just looking at one hip. We need to look at why am I so far on this right side? I need to get, I need to get my internal rotation on the left better by getting my adductors, I need my internal obliques on the left. I didn't get my whole weight shifted. You don't have any internal rotation here. You're not gonna fix it by opening up more external rotation, dude. This is still shitty. Like, and he's saying it's good. So I see this and I'm like, and he's like, and she's on the right track. It's like, I see this and I'm like, this is bullshit. So I kind of started looking more into it. Addison is extremely strong. 
and extremely flexible. But unfortunately, way too flexible. That's all orientation patterns right there. She's just moving up the spine. Fortunately, has dealt with frustrating hip pain for a full year that has limited one simple movements for her and hurt her technique when lifting. My testing revealed limitations in opening her left hip. Already went over why this is kind of a bad test. And with you want more objective tests, things that give you like readings with osseous blockages so you can't, it's not really objective at all. You, you get a bony stop where you know where something is. Internal rotation as well compared to the right. But after As I said earlier in the last video, I didn't, I didn't even realize on this one, she's gonna be missing more internal rotation on there, so she is. If he checked external rotation, in, not in that hip position, maybe just like seated and excellent rotated or even passively on her back and excellent rotated, she probably would have a lot more in the left than the right, I'd be willing to bet. Implementing this plan, she was able to squat without a Again, you have bands around your around your ankles. You don't need to promote more external rotation. But a shift and without pain. There was still a shift there too. With the banded joint mobilization in the pigeon pose. Doing nothing for her. Rotation and a kneeling, holding onto a bench for internal rotation. Then one more hip opener with the assistance. More of external pose. rotation. Then we stabilized over. More the external pose. rotation. Side plank clamshell. The DNS star with the more external pose. rotation. As well as the locked clam. More external rotation. Last, a banded. Hip more pose. external rotation. So he did one thing that was for internal rotation, the band of distraction, and not really. So I'm watching him do these things for this poor girl. I'm like, he's not fucking helping her. He's full of shit. The glute to open the hip for two to three seconds or a few different squat depths. This now allowed her to move without problems in all the higher stretches. And with not the approach to mobilize, stabilize, and integrate this new motion and stability into her lifts, she's on the right track for a great comeback. No, she's not. Let's look at one more. Madison is an elite weightlifter who's been dealing with left hip pain for a year and a half that's been affecting her lifting. Because you got no internal rotation, bro. Without full relief. When we Including you. Together, I wanted to first check her hip mobility. She had a lot of internal rotation on the right, but was limited and very painful on the left. Same with hip opening. Because there's no Plus space, the bro. Next, I had her do a single leg squat. A simple Terrible assessment for someone presenting pain. Extremely difficult on the left. So with our deficits exposed, we got to work. I had her start with a ton of tension on a band and perform joint mobilizations. Not enough tension to actually do something to a joint. For both internal and external rotation. Then it was rotational control. Work More external. The airplane, slowly rotating up and down. Followed by her favorite, the DNS star. The cue is to squat your hips down towards your back foot. You can do this really promoting internal rotation if you turn that hip in really. If she were to turn this right hip really over the left on the way down, and just really maybe do that partial range. I do that sometimes to promote IR. That would be great, but it's not what they're doing. You'll feel your downside glutes working really hard. That's probably why she likes it though, because she does get deep in there and it probably loosens her up. Once you feel the glute, then squat. In a week, she's already progressed these and seen good changes with her lifting with left. I knew this guy was so full of shit when I'm watching this. Showing she's on the right track. All right, so I decided to investigate. I said, okay, either I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about or this girl's not on the right track. I didn't see any more posts from her on, on his Instagram. I go, I bet you she's still fucked up. I looked at her Instagram and no joke, this is like two, day, two days ago. The day I look at her Instagram, this is her post. This is her looking all sad. I don't really have a direction going to the gym lately. I haven't taken more than a couple days off of weightlifting ever and I'm about to hit my two week mark. I'm able to do light stuff. I'll be taking another month off fixing my imbalances and then I'll try again. Here's a few things that didn't hurt, yay. He didn't do a fucking thing to fix her. He promoted her issue, made it worse. And like this guy has like a million followers on Instagram. He's, he's very old school, very like old textbook. He doesn't look at the whole picture and this girl suffered for it. So not a big fan of Squat University when it comes to him treating people with hip pain. All right, let's roll through this real quick. Uh, Atlas Power Shrug, he's pretty cool. I follow him, he does some old school moves. And this is taking a shot of guy in the personal training industry. Uh, John Goodman and he's John Goodman says in 16 years I've never been injured lifting weights the reason is simple I don't go as hard as I can in the gym lifting for regular people has a risk reward ratio to respect no pain No gain is silly you can afford to get fit or slower You can't afford to get hurt and then Atlas power says wrong in fact I'd say you can't afford not to get hurt if you're under 30 fucking stupid if you're an average person and you're not trying to Compete in any kind of athletic endeavor if you're just trying to bodybuild. There's no reason to ever be injured I mean, nothing more than a slight acute little tightness would, is what I would say would be okay. So I think this is kind of stupid to promote. I really don't see anything wrong with uh, what John said at all. And I don't think it's about making someone afraid. It's just saying, especially for the common people, like, stimulate, don't annihilate. Just like Lee Haney said, you know? I'm not going to read all that. 
All right, so the last thing I'm gonna do a hot take on is Mike Van Wick, and I actually like Mike Wick a lot. He says, says it how it is. Um, he's not always right about a lot of things, and this post is just ridiculous, but I still love him. It's fascinating to me. Someone somewhere did a fucking experiment, research paper, to prove what we all already know. And now people would be like, now I can do stuff up that way. Now that science told me. What else does science tell you? That totally agree with him on this. If you guys wait for studies and you wait for science to confirm shit, you're behind. Yeah, the fucking hip thrusts are bullshit, as they are. Wait till that paper comes out. Hip thrusts are bullshit. I don't know if I agree with you there, Mike. That's not backed up by someone who's paying for it. When every real exercise scientist come out and be like, yes, when it's at the top of the contracted motion, there's a lot of muscle recruitment. There's a lot of contractile force of the hip going up. But I mean, you gotta realize people aren't doing just hip thrusts, especially if these girls are trying to build their butts. There's nothing wrong with really focusing on the short range on one exercise. You're doing RDLs and other things to hit the length and range on other ones. But on the way down, there's jack shit. And the way down... You don't have to make it so there's jack shit. You can keep tension. You can still get a decent amount of hip flexion. You can still get a decent stretch, even though that's not the focus. Down is what we give a fuck about in bodybuilding. I don't care how hard I can squeeze something. I don't do all my bench press reps at half reps. I can go, uh, and then go, uh. It is a little different. I mean, when you are holding the end range of a bench press, you don't have nearly the same tension if you're holding the end range of a hip extension. It's totally different lines of tension. Uh, right? So what makes you think that doing booty like that is gonna grow your booty? You're does every girl with a fat ass does it? You're just mentally stimulated and you have a connection to the muscle because you're flexing it. The hip transfer is like literally, some girls sit on the ground again and then they fucking come up. But all that is is them leaning back against, literally leaning back against the back pad and pushing their hip out. So it's a hip hinge. It's driving out of your hip. Yeah, that's the point. Which is not your ass. I hate to break that to everybody. You guys don't understand. Your hip is not your ass. Your hip is a, is a fu <laughs> What the fuck does that mean? Your hip is not your ass? Fucking joint with like two legs coming off of it. You know what I mean? In your, in your spine. What the fuck did you just say, Mike? Which is not your ass. I hate to break that to everybody. You guys don't understand. Your hip is not your ass. Your hip is a, is a fucking joint with like two legs coming off of it. You know what I mean? And your, and your spine comes down into it. What the fuck is he talking about? Like he's just rambling on. No, your hip is not your ass. Your hip, you know, are bones and they form a joint. Your, you know, tricep is not your elbow, but you still activate it through extension. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, Mike. It is a bony joint. It is not your ass. <laughs> All right, bro. I don't know where you're at on that. I'm with you a lot of times, but not there.